Our speaker tonight is John Tufts. John is uh, an actor. He's performed at Chicago Shakespeare Theater. He's performed in major theaters around the country, a Shakespearean actor, and he's a professional cook too. And he has combined his two passions by producing a book, um, Fat Rascals, Dining at Shakespeare's Table, which he'll be talking about. And he's recreated or adapted recipes that are delicious from, from Shakespeare's time. Hi, John. And, uh, and uh, he, he will be talking tonight. And I hope he's going to give us some insight into the witch's brew from Macbeth, you know, Eye of Newt, Toe of Frog. And I wonder if he's adapted that and used any ketchup in it to make it a little more to our taste. But anyway, John, uh, if you can if you can put on your Shakespearean outfit or Shakespearean thought, and just uh, zoom us to Shakespeare Culinary School. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for that introduction. Um, yes, I I'm so thrilled to be talking to you guys today, and um, I'm enjoying all of the different backgrounds that I see on the monitor that I'm looking at from. It looks like uh, everything from wood paneling to closets to palm trees. It's just lovely. So welcome to the, the conversation today about, about Shakespeare and food. Um, so I'm just going to get started. And uh, I wanted to talk to you guys about Shakespeare and food and sort of my relationship to everything. So my name is John Tufts. I'm an actor. Uh, I'm, as Scott said, I'm also a cook and I do a lot of Shakespeare. I have done um, 23 of his 37 plays. Um, my wife and I often joke that Shakespeare pays our mortgage, <laughs> which, you know, ain't bad. Not, not a lot of people get to pay their mortgage because they wear tights for a living. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm also a cook. I cater partings, parties and weddings. And uh, one of my early job jobs, we call them job jobs as actors when, when we do a like a, a, a job that isn't working on stage. Um, one of my early job jobs when my wife and I were doing Romeo and Juliet was working in a restaurant. Um, and so, you know, uh, uh, cooking in a restaurant. And so that's, I've, I've spent a lot of time um, in, back in the kitchen and a significant amount of time, of course, on stage. So food, uh, family and Shakespeare are sort of my three loves. Uh, and that's great because when, you know, family's driving me nuts, I've always got something good to eat and something fascinating to read. Uh, and anyway, so Scott wanted me to talk to you guys today about Shakespeare and food. Um, before I get launched fully into this, I just want to make sure that everybody can hear me fine. So if you will just give a thumbs up, and if you give me that thumbs up, then I know that I can be heard okay by the group. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm thrilled. Um, so yes, as Scott mentioned, this year I wrote a book called Fat Rascals Dining at Shakespeare's Table. Um, you can probably see it over there. Uh, and it's a cookbook that's all about the food that appears in Shakespeare's plays. Um, when Scott called me, he told me that he had heard about this book and then he wanted me to possibly do a, a talk with the culinary historians of Chicago. And when he asked me to do this, I thought, you know, no, <laughs> absolutely not. I'm not a historian uh, in any capacity. I'm, I'm an enthusiast. Uh, and I'm the last person that should be talking to a group of people that have this banner of, you know, historian. Um, you guys, you guys know more than I know. So I thought it was kind of hilarious that I was being asked to do this. But Scott insisted, and um, and he said that there was nothing to worry about. That the name, culinary historians of Chicago, was much more intimidating than perhaps it warranted. And uh, and so I thought about it a little bit. And then I was talking to my brother actually about coming to talk to you guys tonight, and. My brother is an astrophysicist and he works for a lab in Southern California and he designs these enormous telescopes. Um, and so he designs these enormous telescopes that are stationed all throughout the world and then he designs the infrared devices for these telescopes. 
and uh, and he spends all day researching dark matter, basically, and kind of doing math problems to calculate the rate of expansion of the universe and things like that. And so as I, as I was talking to him about coming to talk to you guys, he said, you don't need to worry about that. We, we love the amateur people. Like we professional astronomers love amateur astronomers. We, because, because when we're spending all day kind of looking at one simple math problem or, or spending our entire careers trying to look for the next supernova, when we encounter an enthusiast, it kind of reminds us why we love this in the first place and why we wanted to do this in the first place. So maybe possibly something good can, can come from an enthusiast because we're so enthusiastic about what we do. So that's as much as I'll talk about astrophysics. That's literally the limit of everything I know. So Shakespeare and food. Uh, my talk today will be about the, the process of creating this book and the discoveries made along that route to creating the book itself. Um, how did this all come about? Why does some actor who travels the country doing plays, why would somebody like me want to write a book about Shakespeare and food? Uh, about 10 years ago, I was doing this production of Shakespeare's Henry IV Part I. And there's a moment in the play, uh, at the end of the first half of the play, that actors we kind of loosely refer to as the East Cheap scene. And it's a scene where Falstaff and Hal are in the bar in, in the East Cheap part of London. And the, the bar is called the Boar's Head Tavern or the Boar's Head Inn. And uh, Prince Hal and, and Falstaff are just sort of going at it. They're, 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 they're hurling insults at one another. And they're doing this because Prince Hal has just discovered or just kind of trapped Falstaff in this hilarious scheme where he's made him think like he's going to jail for a long time for this robbery that went south. And so when, when Falstaff realizes Hal was behind the whole thing, they start hurling insults at one another. And Hal at one point refers to Falstaff as a roasted Manning tree ox with the pudding in his belly. And it's this brilliant line because it's so evocative of Falstaff's size. It's so evocative of, of kind of his attitude, his whole um, comportment. And it's meant to be gross. It's meant to be kind of this disgusting image roasted Manning tree ox with pudding in his belly. So like this roasted ox with sausage kind of in a bladder of, you know, tied up inside the belly of this ox that's roasting. And it's meant to be disgusting, just kind of like a lard on lard kind of image. And I would say this line every night on stage in front of 1200 people. And my mind would always wonder as I was saying the line, because I would think that doesn't sound disgusting at all. That actually sounds kind of delicious to have this like roast ox with this sausage and all of these incredible things and an awful OFFAL, you know, uh, it just sounds delicious. Wouldn't it be cool to make that someday? Wouldn't it be cool to make some of the stuff that appears in these plays in general, like Twelfth Night Cake or, or, uh, or roast venison, things like that? Like, wouldn't it be cool to make some of the things that are in the play? And wouldn't it be cool if there were a book that were about all of the food that appears in Shakespeare, that actually celebrated the food that appears in Shakespeare. And then my crazy, I guess somewhat slightly narcissistic mind, I was like, wouldn't it be cool if I wrote that book? You know, I know so much about writing cookbooks. And I bet that if I wrote a cookbook that was all about the food that appears in Shakespeare, I could probably sell like 10 copies of it at American Players Theater one summer. And so I got to work writing that book. But the thing is, I didn't just want to write a cookbook with recipes in it. I wanted to find a way through the creation of this book to kind of like travel back in time. You know, travel, time travel, as, as much as we know, you know, is, is not, according to my astrophysicist brother, is, you know, can't really be done going back into the past at least. But, but even if relativity prevents us from going back to the past, maybe we can substitute that a little bit by tasting some of the past. And so I wanted to write this cookbook. I wanted to travel back in time. The trick, of course, for me was finding the time to do this particular thing. I'm not famous by any stretch, but I'm lucky, very lucky to work a lot. 
I do between four and five shows a year when there's not a pandemic going on. Uh, and my, my teachers from school l love to call me like a blue collar actor. They're like, you work, you save, I pay my New York real estate taxes, you know, but I, it doesn't, when all that's, I, I, tra I travel the, the country. And sometimes I'm lucky to get to, to go to other countries and do what I love doing, but it doesn't leave a lot of time for things like writing cookbooks, you know. But I wanted to do this thing. And so I thought, well, I, I, sort of time be damned, I'm gonna do it. But I needed to start with, with research. And that's sort of where a lot of what this, this talk is about comes in. Um, the research to write this book, I had sort of four main groups, thrilling groups uh, that I used as the bodies of work to come up with the material for the book itself. The first, of course, were the plays themselves. Here we have 37 plays with hundreds of references to food. Shakespeare talks about food frequently throughout the plays. He talks about food people eat, um, for example. So in uh, one great example that I love is in Henry IV Part II, there's a character named Justice Shallow who's kind of presiding over a mock trial at one point in the play. And Justice Shallow uh, places an order with his servant, Davy, and he asks for a few things from his servant, Davy. And he says, some pigeons, Davy, a couple of short-legged hens, uh, a, a roast joint of mutton, and some pretty tiny little kickshaws, tell William Cook. And when I read that, I thought, oh, that's sublime. That's like an entire menu of things that would be eaten at, at an Elizabethan feast. Uh, but in addition to talk Shakespeare, in addition to talking about food that people eat, uh, he, he talks about how characters are, are setting out to hunt for food or procure food. So in As You Like It, there's a reference from a character, Duke Senior. Duke Senior's been exiled into the forest of Arden and he's sitting around with a bunch of his men. And uh, there, there's a, another character from the court who finds himself in exile as well, Jaques. And Jaques is talking about um, he's sort of, you know, Jaques is known as melancholy Jaques. And he's talking about uh, how sad it is that something like venison would be hunted in the forest. And he tells this incredibly sad story about, about the cost of, um, of, of killing an animal. And then immediately after that, Duke Senior, to kind of make fun of Jaques, says, come, shall we go and kill us some venison? And so, you know, that would be, say, an example of going up to procure things. But Shakespeare also, you know, in addition to talking about food that people eat or food that people acquire, he also bakes his characters into food at one point. Um, there's in Titus Andronicus, there are these two characters, uh, um, Demetrius and Chiron. And Demetrius and Chiron have assaulted, sexually assaulted um, Titus's daughter, Lavinia. And they've just committed this horrible atrocity. And Titus is so enraged over the act and he's so he wants to punish them so harshly and when he captures them and he he has them in shackles uh and he he the the punishment that he lays out for them he says i shall grind your bones into a dust and with your blood and it i'll make a paste and with the paste i'll make a coffin i will rear and uh, and and make two uh, and make two pastries of your shameful heads and so he basically talks about this recipe, essentially a recipe for this kind of cannibalistic pie that he's going to make. And then in the most probably single most horrifying moment in all of Shakespeare, he does just that off stage and then on stage brings out this pie of Demetrius and, Chi uh, Demetrius and Chiron and feeds it to their mother, uh, Tamara. And the whole audience knows what's happened and they're witnessing this thing take place. So there's this relationship that Shakespeare has with food kind of um, woven throughout all 37 plays. And the challenge for me was finding all of the food references that I could. While there are, are, are many appendices for Shakespeare, for all sorts of topics, um, I, to my knowledge, I've yet to find one that's like the, you know, the, the Cambridge companion to Shakespeare in food or the Oxford you know, concordance for Shakespeare and edible things. There's nothing kind of like that right now. 
Uh, and so I kind of had to set out in a way to do a lot of that on my own to find that, that information, which basically meant me going through the plays and pulling as much material that I could find, anything that, that remotely related to food in any capacity. I, I scanned them for list of ingredients. I, I looked for uh, mentions of, of things that, that, are, that are famous and then things that are actually kind of mundane. So you might have a famous quote like, you know, what shall there be no more cakes and ale, which is a super famous quote about something in, in Twelfth Night, about food in Twelfth Night, to more mundane things that might be just passing references to food. And of course, much of Shakespeare's food talk is rhetorical. It's, it's, it's used as a device, as a figure of speech. It's not meant to be a literal thing that somebody eats. Uh, in, in, in one play, for example, I think it's in um, uh, Julius Caesar or Coriolanus, I can't quite remember, one of the Roman plays, a character talks uh, about, Shakespeare has a character talk about uh, another character carbonadoing someone. So carbonadoing is, is not actually, in this reference, he's not actually talking about food, but he's using a food technique uh, in a rhetorical way as a kind of figure of speech to, to talk about it in a, in a militaristic sense, you know, how that character is going to, to, uh, to destroy that other character in this kind of food technique. So carbonadoing is a, is a method, there are kind of two ways you can think about it, a method of grilling or a method of kind of scoring a piece of meat before it's put onto the grill. And sometimes that scoring of the piece of meat would be called scotching. And that's another thing that Shakespeare uses in Macbeth talks about uh, uh, scotching somebody and, that, and, and, and in that case, like literally carving them with a, with a blade. So it's not unlike today where we might say, um, you know, the witness was grilled uh, when we're talking about a courtroom or uh, an opponent was smoked or something like that, you know, or, um, or, or making, mince, making mincemeat of somebody, that kind of thing. Where we're not literally turning that person into mincemeat. It's just kind of a figure of speech. Well, Shakespeare, of course, does that far more than he talks about actual food that people eat. So in terms of bodies of research, the plays themselves, that was my primary body of research, of course. Any small mention, uh, at least at the research phase, did not go unnoticed as I was compiling stuff for the book. The next major source of research, and this was one of my favorites, was this amazing book by Peter Breers called Cooking and Dining in uh, Tudor in early Stuart England. I think I got the title right. If I got it wrong, you can see on the, the picture next to me. But th this thing is a mammoth. And I think it's made for people that, that are passionate about food history and Peter Beer's work in general. He wrote significantly and famously about the medieval era. And then also this book was sort of a, a, a fantastic follow-up to medieval cookery by talking about um, what I call Shakespearean cuisine and what he would call, you know, uh, Elizabethan Tudor, Jacobean, and whatever. Um, it's, it's a work of supreme study. It's, it's a textbook of the highest order. I found this book in my research uh, at this brilliant bookstore in New York uh, called Kitchen Arts and Letters. Um, there's, this is an actual picture of the bookstore itself, it, just one shelf at the bookstore. The bookstore is not much larger than that one shelf, but I'd say it's about seven or so more shelves just like it floor to ceiling of cookbooks that are new and cookbooks that are out of print. It was amazing and I got lost in there. I went into this sort of slightly digressive story. I went into this um, cookbook because I was doing a show in New York City at the time and I wanted to find a, a cookbook, a kind of out of print cookbook by the French chef Roger Verger. So Roger Verger was a French chef who ran this restaurant in the south of France called Moulin de Mougin. Uh, which was kind of um, the, the beginning of haute cuisine for, for Provençal cooking. And I had heard about this cookbook and I uh, called Entertaining in the French Style, which is sort of like Provençal cooking at home. I wanted to find this cookbook. I figured I could find it at this bookstore. So I go into this bookstore and when I'm walking in, don't worry, I'm going to get back to Shakespeare really quickly. But I, uh, when I'm walking into the bookstore, there, there's the owner of the bookstore seated behind the counter and then his new employee is kind of stamping new inventory to record into the stock. And as I walk, just as I walk into the cook store, cookbook store, she says, you know, uh, uh, what category should I put Roger Vergies under? 
and I hear this and I go, well, this is perfect. I can't think of any better place to be. This is the, the most serendipitous encounter with, with cookbooks that I could possibly hope for. So I think this might be the right place. Um, in that same visit, I asked the, the cookbook store owner uh, if he had any books about Elizabethan or Tudor cooking. And he said, well, I have Breers. Do you like Breers? And I said, yeah, totally. But I had no idea who Breers was at this point. Uh, and then he points to it on the shelf. I take it off the shelf and I crack this thing open and I'm thinking, oh, I'm in way over my head. His book has everything, guys. It's, it's not just recipes for things. It's also rules for cutlery. It's uh, customs for washing hands at the table. It's who enters a room and when, who has the right to speak and when. Um, it's got architectural kind of elevations of, cookie, uh, of, of cooking tools and vessels. It's got um, architectural drawings of hearth ovens and buildings and uh, brew houses, things like that. It's a mammoth, but it was Breer's, as I'm looking through this book, that was sort of the main guide uh, and, and also the, the doorway to all of the original contemporary sources, uh, sources contemporary to Shakespeare, as I was figuring out what to look for uh, to find contemporary stuff for these recipes, for the things that are mentioned in the plays. The most primary thing that Breer's talked about or primary contemporary source, original source that Breers talked about was Robert May. Um, Robert May wrote a book called The Accomplished Cook. And he wrote this during the restoration, during the reign of Charles II. Um, so we're talking a good 60 years after Shakespeare's death. Um, but Robert May began his career during the reign of Charles I, so pretty much immediately after Shakespeare's death. And then during the uh, during when Oliver Cromwell uh, uh, beheaded Charles I, and then it became dangerous for any royalists to be in England, um, Robert May, who had been associated with uh, Charles I, fled to France and then returned during the reign of Charles II in the Restoration. So this is right around the time of Shakespeare. Well, you can imagine, it's the exact same story that you hear about anybody when they go away to France for a few years and then come back, they kind of bring all of the France that they've absorbed with them. And Robert May does exactly that. He brings back all of these very French recipes. But what I love about his work as I was looking to include it in this book is he really straddles the world of Shakespeare's England and Restoration England. Uh, he, he has simple dishes like, like a meat pie or he has uh, fancy things like um, he calls it the, the stew of beef gobbets in the French fashion. So slightly more elaborate things that he's brought back from the continent. His food was both heavily English and heavily French and coexisting at the same time. It wasn't like 50% English, 50% French. It was like all in on both, in both camps. He carries, um, for those interested in sort of slightly more recent food history, he reminded me a lot of, of, of Brias Savarin, the, the, the French gourmand who wrote that famous quote, the, you know, show me, I forgot, oh gosh, I'm already forgetting it. Show me what, what, what a man eats and I'll tell you what he is. Or, or, I'm butchering it, but it's that kind of thing. Um, he, he, as I was reading through Robert May, I was thinking he's, he's, he's almost like a, like a precursor or a, a father to Brias Savarin. He has all of these very precious musings about food. He has a very particular way he, he wants things to be done. You can tell that Robert May was somebody who, who, who was a kind of gourmand of the highest order. He has loads of opinions about things and, and his, his recipes have that quality as you read them of somebody who likes things just so. Uh, Another writer mentioned by Breers that I wanted, that I used as a, 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 for a huge amount of research was Jarvis Markham. Uh, Jarvis Markham was almost an exact contemporary of Shakespeare. He was born, I think a year after Shakespeare and then died a year or two before Shakespeare. So almost an exact contemporary of Shakespeare. And he wrote a book called The English Housewife's Journal. Well, this was a remarkable piece of writing and I, I 
I loved it. Uh, it was a manual of sorts for women who ran large estates. So if you were the matriarch of, a, of a, an aristocratic family, you, 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 you ran your estate like a business. I mean, it was, you, you were in charge of so many different things and you had to make sure that all of those different things were in order. You were in charge of the, the ale house. You were in charge of the bake house. You were in charge of the roasting kitchen. You were in charge of the boiler room. And, and you had to kind of make sure that the estate was being run as efficiently as possible. Well, if you take over one of these estates, and, midlife or something, and you're not entirely certain how to do that, you had these manuals. And Robert, or, or Jarvis Markham published one of these called the English Housewife's Journal. Uh, it, as you read through it, it has a, a lot of qualities like you would see in a 1950s homemaking book um, for housewives in the 1950s. That, that, you know, they would cover everything from recipes, of course, but then also things like making a good impression or you know, how the best way to carry a jello mold or something like that. This particular one, Jarvis Markham's book, in addition to the recipes, had things like um, tips for curing halitosis or uh, elixirs, uh, particularly with, you know, with particular efficacy for, for baldness or uh, also other elixirs that might help you with erectile dysfunction, stuff like that. Well, aside from its more snake oil characteristics, uh, the book has hundreds of recipes, loads of things that are, that are useful for anybody compiling stuff uh, to, to compare against mentions in Shakespeare's plays. It also famously has the earliest known recipe for an Oxfordshire cake. And so this Oxfordshire cake is brilliant for the, the use of a book like mine because uh, it's the cake that's talked about and probably the most famous reference in all of Shakespeare, food reference in all of Shakespeare, which is in Twelfth Night, when Toby Belch says, what, shall, the, shall there be no more cakes in ale? Um, and the, the, the cake, you know, that Sir Toby Belch is likely talking about there is an Oxfordshire cake. So I thought, how incredible to have a recipe for this Oxfordshire cake written at the exact, right around the exact same time that the actor playing Toby Belch was saying it perhaps on the Globe stage. There were many, many other books from this period that I used, not just Markham's book and Robert May's book. Uh, many others that I used, but those were the primary ones. So I won't bore you with all of the minutia of, of the particular ones that I used. Um, next, I think once I kind of had all of these uh, recipes together and, and what recipes I wanted to use, I, I kind of had to revisit the goal of the whole thing and go, okay, what is my goal of this book? Aside from just writing a cookbook, what, what, were, what was the actual direction that I wanted this thing to go? One major goal that everything kind of was boiling down to was this notion of authenticity. Every cookbook writer and every writer that, that is kind of wanting to do anything about the past, wants to claim some measure of authenticity, an authentic book about Shakespeare's food. I knew I wanted to be authentic and I knew I wanted to pursue being as authentic as possible. But the question with authenticity is always, well, where does it stop? When, when considering authenticity, we can't just consider ingredients or recipes. We also have to consider things like technique and preparation customs of dining or tools used, the, the entire culture of eating. Cuisine, as you guys know, does not just exist in a vacuum. It is an art influenced, as influenced by context as any other art form. For example, you know, in, in French cuisine, when we think about French cuisine, and, and French cuisine tends to dominate um, French cuisine tends to dominate our, 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 our Western thinking of, 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 of cooking culture. But when we think of, of French cuisine, we, we mostly think of a very limited period of time, like the, the era of Escoffier, this very, very limited period of, period of time in the end of the 19th century, the very, very beginning of the 20th century. But that has shaped our entire popular perception of French cooking. When people have that notion of French cooking as being like cream and butter and stuff like that, we all get that from this very narrow period of time. But that period of time 
of Escoffier, as you guys know, was heavily influenced by early modern art, by, by you know, the writing of Proust, or by changing politics, by the theater, opera, wealth, um, early notions of celebrity, everything. Thousands of dishes were created at that time, 1890s to 1904. But we only still eat just a few now, maybe crepe Suzette or, or, and that's on very, very rare occasions. Or if you, maybe you're one of the 12 people who's had like filet of beef Rossini or something like that. But how many of you out there have ever had like quail a la Sarah Bernhardt, <laughs> you know? Um, or, or, or something named after some obscure opera star. Out of context, many of those thousands of dishes are really strange and they seem like museum food. Cuisine, as I was learning throughout all of this research, cuisine is intramuscular with culture. Culture flexes its muscle and then the trends of food and all of the dishes that come out, those change as well. It's like a ripple effect. So with culture having such a strong influence, especially on Shakespeare's food, I knew I didn't wanna create just a recipe book. I wanted to find a way to invite culture to the table, the, the culture of theater and the culture of Shakespeare. I wanted context, in other words, and I wanted to find a way for the book to communicate that context. On the other hand though, and this goes to the sort of how authentic to be, I didn't want the book to be so authentic as to be prohibitive or alienating. If people out there saw a book that required we roast everything in a hearth oven, they'd walk right by. This authenticity question, by the way, is exactly what we encounter as actors when we're working on these plays. As I've spent the last 17 years working on his plays as an actor. And every time we go into a room, we, we come up against this question of authenticity. Uh, we ask ourselves, how authentic should we be with this particular play? Do we wear Elizabethan costumes? Do we speak in original pronunciation, which would be a kind of hard thing to decipher, but there are linguistic scientists who can figure that stuff out and they will teach you, should you wish. How much text do we keep? Do we cut anything or do we do all four hours of Hamlet? And it's made extra tricky because, with the text question at least, because with Shakespeare, the text is often elusive. Those texts that were published in his lifetime are often problematic. They have little mistakes, uh, printing errors, that kind of thing. And then those, the only other texts, the ones that are considered authoritative, are published uh, seven years after his death in 1623. So then you have um, a lot of hindsight shaping that text. With those changes, that means that the text isn't even necessarily um, uh, the, the Bible, so to speak. And sometimes even a kind of spiritual authenticity is different than a material authenticity. Um, I've seen productions of Midsummer Night's Dream, for example, where actors have cell phones and wear jeans and t-shirts that feel far more spiritually authentic than uh, a production of Midsummer in Elizabethan dress with doublets and hose and ruffs that kind of thing. So for me, as I was kind of trying to figure out how authentic to be, the answer always comes back to the words themselves. As with Shakespeare, it's the words that matter. So I wanted these recipes to be, I wanted the words of those recipes with Robert May, the words of the recipes of Jarvis Markham or Eleanor Fetaplace or others that I used. I wanted those, their words to matter as much as possible. So I kept the ingredients the same. Uh, where possible, I kept the preparations the same. And, uh, uh, and I tried to do that as much as what was mentioned in those early cookbooks. And then to, to, to give a little sense of context, I added you know, fun little things, or at least things that I thought would be fun, like, like how to fold a napkin or, or in, in an elaborate way. So you know, here I have a a swan, for example, but Elizabethan napkin folding would have been far crazier than just the swan. But the swan was about the, the, the end of my limits. And I figured if it's the end of my limits, then it, it, it could be just doable for, for other people as well. But you would see uh, folding techniques mentioned in these books that would be not just swans, but they would be bouquets of all kinds of things that required elaborate 
fine linens, heavily pressed, that sort of thing. Um, and then other fun stuff, I, I wanted to give an indication, should you be so curious, an indication of how to roast in a hearth oven. And so I, I did a test in my mom's beautiful hearth oven in North Georgia of, of roasting some hens. And, um, and we were able to kind of use those Shakespearean techniques of providing a heat source uh, behind the roast and, uh, and, and then have a drip pan underneath everything and then, and then slowly, slowly turn it. What I don't include are, are uh, uh, when it came to the roasting at least, is I learned that in Elizabethan kitchens, um, you would, there were many different ways that things could be roasted. You would have several different spits running at the same time and that uh, boys could be hired to operate those spits. So they would be turning them very delicately and you would see a, a ladder kind of leaning up against the hearth oven with several skewers kind of running up that ladder and then a boy would you know, turn one and then the other and then the other, or they all might be on a kind of pulley system and then he'll simply just pull those pulleys so that they all rotate at the same time. Uh, other kitchens, and this is absolutely true, would have a wheel and that wheel was connected to a series of rudimentary gears that would turn those skewers and then inside the wheel would be a dog, like a well-trained Jack Russell that just had boundless energy and that dog would be running in that wheel which would be turning those spits so you could have something like that. That of course is something that appears in Shakespeare in, um, in uh, uh, what is it, Two, Two Gentlemen of Verona, you have um, the dog Crab and Crab is the dog that is that that um, is Sylvia's dog, and Launce, who's the fool in the play, takes Crab the dog away from the kitchen, and he tells this whole story about how the dog couldn't do his job in the kitchen, then ended up eating some of the hens and some of the capons, uh, and and so we have this kind of cool cross reference between something that was actual, how things were roasted on a spit, to something that appears in a play. So I wanted to include as much of those things as possible in the, in the book without being too alienated. Um, the hope was that there would be a nice balance between the authentic and the obtainable. So authentic napkin folding, but attainable because it's just a swan. Um, all right, the recipes. How to choose the recipes, or at least how I chose these particular recipes. First, again, I started with the plays. If there was even a passing reference to some kind of food, I put it in. If, 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 if a play mentioned, say, salmon, even if it had nothing to do with how to eat it or how to cook it, I, I looked for different salmon recipes from the era and, uh, and then figured out what to use. Hundreds of recipes there are to choose from, um, uh, from this era. Thousands of recipes to choose from that, that, that I could include in the book. Um, and many of those fall into the, when we're talking about authentic versus attainable, obtainable, many of those fall into the less obtainable side. Um, for example, peacock. I, I looked at, Robert May has several preparations for roasting peacock and how to do it and how to prop up the head when you present it to the table. And I thought, you know, that's cool, but where, where people might be curious about how to do that, but where are we actually gonna find peacock to roast? So it didn't go in the book. Some slightly more obscure things went in, like venison or, or capon and, um, or mutton, that kind of stuff. But I figured mutton would be about as far as I went into being obscure. Uh, I also didn't include, Robert May had one that was fascinating, um, which was a, a, a pastry recipe that was intended to be used for live frogs and snakes. I thought, you know, I can leave that one out. But it was a fascinating recipe, if you're curious. Robert May included this because he, it was intended to be used, um, live frogs and snakes were intended to be used uh, in, a, in a pastry case for uh, the purposes of a wedding. So in, a, in an Elizabethan era or restoration era wedding, at the end of the wedding, um, as the bride and groom were going off, uh, all of the people attending the wedding, they wanna celebrate the, the new sexual union between the bride and groom as much as the bride and groom are celebrating it. And so they would concoct a plan to sort of get everybody riled up. And, um, and so Robert May talks about this pastry case that would have live frogs and snakes in it. Now you might be wondering, what on earth does that contribute to your libido? And, uh, and it's a great question. And I have yet to figure out exactly why, but the premise, at least as Robert May was talking about, was that 
say, uh, 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 the, the men would say to the women, okay, now cut open the pie. It's time to eat the pie. And then they would cut it open. And then rather than there be, say, pie inside, there would be live frogs and snakes that would leap out. Presumably, every, all of the, the women would get scared and then the men would come and, to their rescue and protect them and then go off and celebrate the union of brides and grooms. That did not make it in the book. I left that one conveniently out, just for stories afterwards. Uh, I, I wanted recipes that represented seasonality. Um, seasonality, as you can imagine, for an agrarian culture was hugely important to the food. You only cook what's available. Uh, it's, it's not like now where you could have avocados year round or asparagus in, in January. Um, for, for the Elizabethans, seasonality was a necessity, not, not a trend or not uh, an effort. It was the only thing. Um, but seasonality didn't just have to do with the four seasons of the year. Seasonality for Shakespeare's food was also governed by the liturgical calendar, so the, 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 the calendar of the church. Um, the church with, with say, the, the, the Catholic church, with pre-Henry VIII, and then the Protestant church, um, even uh, in the time of Shakespeare, had a, a huge influence on the everyday life of everybody in England, as you can imagine. And a lot of the Catholic um, customs uh, remained after, after uh, the Church of England was established. Um, so it's not like the Church of England came along and then all of a sudden everybody was eating fish on Friday, or everybody was eating meat on Friday. Uh, it, it, the, the fact is that liturgical governance remained throughout um, uh, Elizabethan England. And that, that, that decided a lot of what people ate. So obviously things like Lent, you would not eat meat or dairy during Lent. Um, you would not eat meat or dairy on Fridays. You also didn't eat meat or dairy during Advent. Um, and on Wednesdays, Wednesdays was supposedly the day that Judas sold out Jesus to the Romans. And so Wednesdays were reserved for a kind of quiet reflection as well. So that when all was totaled, you had well over 200 days of the year that were uh, restricted days in terms of what people could eat. That meant no dairy and no meat. Now fish wasn't considered meat, but poultry and, uh, and obviously red meat, and lamb and stuff like that was considered meat. So that meant all kinds of substitutes were brought in for those dairy items. So here we get early recipes for things like almond milk. Almond milk was hugely popular. It wasn't just popular for restricted days, its popularity extended to the rest of the year as well for when people could, could eat, uh, for when people were perfectly allowed to eat dairy. Um, and so things like almond milk and then custards made from almond milk and then almond milk as a substitute for dairy when it would be used to say thicken sauces and things like that was used heavily. Um, so yes, I wanted recipes that represented uh, seasonality, Shakespeare in the plays, and then some kind of scope of Elizabethan cooking. And that's sort of how I did all that. Um, once all of that seasonality question was sort of addressed, it came time to test these recipes. I only included in the book recipes that tested well uh, and tested well within my limited budget. So it's entirely possible that there were some excellent recipes that Robert May wrote or that Jarvis Markham wrote, but that my very limited actor budget uh, meant that I, I tested it once and couldn't really see a way out of it. And so I thought, well, it's not going to make it in the book. There were some that might not have tested well, but I went, oh, I know what adjustments I can make. I'll, I'll follow up again with a second test. And then if it improves, then it goes in the book. If it doesn't improve, it's out. Um, some areas of the Elizabethan palate, though, proved a bit too foreign for my, for my taste. Uh, th th they were not particularly approachable or, or accessible. For example, uh, in, uh, you know, artichokes braised in plum syrup and then placed atop sops of white bread did not make the cut. Uh, it was just far too, too, too uh, unapproachable for me to have these kind of pallid artichoke bottoms and this this sickly kind of syrup over these, this white bread that was absorbing all the syrup. It didn't make any sense to me. Uh, and so that, that one didn't make it. The final judge for all of my tasting, or, or testing rather, was my seven-year-old son, uh, Henry. Um, 
Henry is, uh, I thought, well, you know, if, if, if a seven-year-old, if he liked it, it's going in the book. And, and, and if he doesn't like it, well, you know, he's seven. What does he know? Um, but the thing is, you know, in, in, in truth, my thinking was if a seven-year-old American child can try stockfish fritters and like them, then, you know, what's your excuse? <laughs> Person who's buying the book, you know, or, or, not, or, or thinking that the recipes might be too unapproachable. Um, then once this was tested, I, I, it was time to really make the book. I had all of these recipes tested. I had all the recipes chosen and what I wanted to do. And, uh, and so it was time to make the book. Of course, none of this, as, as you guys know, if anybody out there has ever tried to create any work independently, um, it, it's, it's meaningless without a significant amount of money. I'm lucky, very, very lucky to be a working actor and work as much as I do. But the fact is, I'm still an actor, you know? Everything that you guys know about actors, unless you're, you know, one of the 0.2% that's super famous, you know, everything that you know about actors, it's true. We, we, we are, we save as much as we can and we live paycheck to paycheck kind of thing. Um, I, I'm not, you know, a, a short seller <laughs> um, making killings off of the real estate market right now, you know, so it, I, I had to raise this money. And I had to raise this money basically by, by doing it the old fashioned way, going around and asking a bunch of people for money. I did that all on social media, of course, so it's a little bit easier than it would have been 25 years ago, but that's what I did. I raised $10,000 to, to do a lot of this research and, and a lot of the recipe testing, and then also to publish the actual book itself. If I had it to do all over again, to be perfectly honest, I would have raised $30,000 and not 10, and then probably even double that just because it's so much goes into it. But with the money raised, um, you know, it was time for me to come up with a layout. Uh, I, 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 I'm not going to bore you guys too much with the details of all of this, but it's fun for me. So hopefully it being fun for me will be somewhat fun for you. Uh, coming up with the layout of a cookbook is hard if you've never come up with the layout of a cookbook before. But I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll sort of steal from the best. And so I have three favorite cookbooks that I used and I kind of compared those three cookbooks. One is a, a book by um, Sean Brock uh, that's called uh, Heritage. My sister was a pastry chef in his kitchen for a while so I got to get to know him and his writing and he's a brilliant writer, cookbook writer. Uh, another one was a cookbook by um, Keith McNally about his restaurant Balthazar and then uh, another one was that the Roger Verge book that I was talking about at the very beginning about entertaining in the French style. So looking at these three very different cookbooks, I was looking at them and going, what are the what things that they share in terms of layout? And what's cool is, you know, they, they all share that similar thing of a recipe on one side, a picture on the other. Uh, and then they have other kind of unique quirks and, and idiosyncrasies that, that I thought, oh, that could be an interesting way to do that. Uh, in Sean Brock's book, he has these things that I call musings, which are periodically throughout the book or just little short stories about moments or how recipes come to life, that kind of stuff. So I wanted to include a lot of that in the book as well. Um, so with all of that done, it came time for me to take pictures. And I'm no photographer, but I do know a little bit about photography. You know, I know about exposure. I know about lighting. Uh, I know about depth of field, things like that. And so I, I wanted to come up with good solid photographs of each of the things, excuse me, each of the things that I made in the book. Well, uh, I, I, you know, I started following a, a guy on Instagram and, and looking at his photographs of food and, and sort of saying, how can he, how did he style those things? And can I, is there any compositional things that I can borrow from him or straight up steal from him uh, to allow me to compose these pictures for the book in a, in a particular fun and fascinating way? Once all of that was done, it was the, the last thing I had to do was come up with a title for this thing. And I had been putting it off and putting it off and putting it off because I, I didn't want it to be like Shakespeare's food or Shakespeare's cooking or something like that. I wanted it to be something that actually was from the plays themselves and really invited uh, the world of the plays. So I, I, I came up with this title, Fat Rascals. Fat Rascals is a reference from Henry IV, part two. Unsurprisingly, those plays, Henry IV, part one, part two, and Henry V, have a lot to do with food because of the character Falstaff. And again, in Henry IV, part two, there's a moment in the play when 
Falstaff is in the Boar's Head Inn. And the Boar's Head Inn is also a brothel, by the way, that Falstaff frequents. And uh, there's a, a woman who works at the, in the brothel, who's one of the prostitutes in the brothel named Doll Tearsheet. And another classic Shakespearean use of a name evoking you know, character through name. So we've got Doll Tearsheet. And Doll and Falstaff are arguing, bickering over something. And Falstaff at one point uh, is trying to insult Doll, Ter Doll Tearsheet and he says, you make fat rascals, Mistress Doll. And it's meant to insult her promiscuity um, or insult her by, by bringing up her promiscuity. Uh, and the fat rascals that she makes are, are uh, the babies that she makes from sleeping with all of the men that frequent the, the, uh, the boar's head inn. And then she then spins that reference right back on him and calls him a fat rascal because of how much food he eats and then also just sort of how rascally he is by how much trouble he's always getting into, uh, the fact that he has no honor, the fact that he um, <clears throat> is, is basically no good. And so I thought, well, that's perfect. I want to have a book called Fat Rascals because um, it evokes the, the world of Shakespeare. It evokes the, the nature of, um, of the eating at the time. You know, this is not like the South Beach diet book. It's Fat Rascals. You know what you're getting into. A lot of pastry that's, that's made with leaf lard, okay? In, in Fat Rascals dining at Shakespeare's table. Um, it's not a delicate, dainty book and it's not delicate, dainty food. And so I thought, oh, it's so great. We can have the world of Shakespeare and the world of knowing what you're getting into when you buy it all in, in the title. So here I am with this book. It's 200 pages. It's 150, you know, authentic recipes and some pictures that actually make everything seem tasty. Uh, and, and that's a, a, a lot of, of kind of how we, we came up with this book. So that's one hour of talking to you guys. And now what I would love to do is I would love to turn this over to questions um, because I would love to get questions from you guys and I would love to talk more about the food that's in the plays. I would love to hear from you guys about what you know about the food that's in the plays. Yes, and I had a quick question. Yeah. Uh, are, you gonna, are you gonna show the Chewitz video? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I can totally do that. To give you a little bit of context as I, as I get this set up, um, uh, I, I made a, a series of videos for Chicago Shakespeare Theater to promote the book and then also to provide content to them um, right when the, the pandemic started because the theaters all shut down. Um, very Shakespearean event took place, but theaters shut down because of the pandemic. And so with, um, they, they, they had said, do, do you have any content you can provide about Shakespeare and food that you'd like to do? And so I made these, a whole series of very short, silly little videos. Uh, and then, uh, and this first one, this was the first one that I did, which was about Chewitz. I talk a little bit about Chewitz in the video, so I won't, I won't talk too much about it right now. Uh, but basically, Chewitz are, uh, a, 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 they cover a variety of different ways in which um, small, portable food was consumed in Shakespeare's England. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so the, the this particular video deals with a, uh, a one version of a recipe for one version of chutz. So I'll play that, and then after that, we can. I, I'd love to uh, take questions from you guys. So, right, thanks. This this will be our cooking uh, cooking demonstration. Hi, everyone who likes Shakespeare, and by every one of you, I mean all one of you. My name is John Tufts, and I'm an actor, and I do a lot of Shakespeare. If you don't believe me, here's a picture of me in tights doing some Shakespeare. Still don't believe me? And honestly, why would I lie about something like that? Here's another picture of me getting sad during a soliloquy. Believe me now. In addition to being an actor, I'm also a cook, and I've written a cookbook called Fat Rascals Dining at Shakespeare's Table. Why did I do this? Well, basically, I thought it would be fun. And when I say fun, I mean actually fun, not fun in that way that I tell my six-year-old. Number bonds are fun. Spelling practice at breakfast is fun. Pick up your room, it's so much fun. I mean, I actually thought it would be fun to travel back in time and taste some of the things that Shakespeare tasted. Some of the things, some of the things. And so that's why I wrote this book, Fat Rascals Dining at Shakespeare's Table. Oh, it's real, baby. It even has blurbs on the back. 
So I spent a year combing Shakespeare's plays. Hmm. 99, 100. And I discovered something. Shakespeare talks a lot about food. He talks about food people eat. He talks about how people look like food. He insults people with food. He names characters after food. He bakes his characters in. Against several 16th century and 17th century cookbooks. I took those recipes, updated them for the modern kitchen, and then compiled them all in this book, Fat Rascals Dining at Shakespeare's Table. And today I'm gonna teach you how to make one of the recipes in the book. Chew it. Chew it. All right, quick literature lesson. In Henry IV, part one, Prince Hal is trying to get Falstaff to be quiet, so he's not discovered by the police, and he says, peace, chew it, peace. Now, a chew it in this case is like a small meat pie, and so Hal is essentially using a fat joke. It's like my mom calling large babies butterballs, or her husband a cream puff, or me a Fourth of July mistake. So, chew it. Let's get started. You're going to need these things. That's a microphone, right? It is a microphone. So you can say, my name is Henry Tufts, into the microphone if you want. My name is Henry Tufts, and I came here to just try and chew it. Oh, all right. Let's, let's, let's see. Let's see if this yeah. chew it will do it. Okay. Good? You want another bite? No, thanks. <laughs> All right, get out of here. All right. 
If you're interested in the book and you want to learn how to make other things, you can go to my website, john-tufts.com, click on Fat Rascals and order the book. Or you can go to your favorite theater's bookshop because they're the only people nerdy enough to actually stock the thing. Did I mention it has blurbs on the back? See you later, Shakespeare nerds. <laughs>
Uh, Annie and Brad asked, uh, is your cookbook footnoted with the wonderful historical information you just shared? Yes. Uh, what, what's funny is I, um, one of the first people that I, I gave a good cookbook to is this friend of mine um, named, uh, it doesn't matter, but uh, it doesn't matter what her name is, but she, uh, she, could call, she called back right away after receiving the book. And she said, I've never in my life read a, a like accessible cookbook that also has footnotes before all of the, the recipes and for the introduction and stuff like that. So uh, I don't do footnotes, I do end notes, but yeah. Um, every, everything is, is marked and then end noted in the, in the bibliography. So you can see all, all of those, uh, all of those things that I talk about and sort of give you, gives you further um, information to explore should you want. Uh, somebody admired how clean and bare your kitchen is. Yeah, well, there's a reason why it's clean and bare, gang. <laughs> the reason is we have lived in this house less than 48 hours. Uh, we, uh, my wife teaches at Syracuse University, so we just moved to a small town in upstate New York, and we have been in this house for less than 48 hours. So our, our kitchen, it looks <laughs> sleek and modern now, but on Saturday when our actual... Um, moving truck arrives, um, it'll, it'll look much less sleek and much, and much more chaotic. We, we were supposed to have all of our things today. Um, uh, we were supposed to be well moved into this house by now, but we have learned all of the um, hoops that you have to jump through in New York real estate. And so everything happened like 40 days later than it was supposed to happen. So here we are in an empty house with an air mattress and my son's Legos and a couple of dish towels so that it looks like it's a working kitchen. So the show goes on, despite everything. The show goes on. The show goes on. I mean, even in a pandemic, the show goes on. Uh, we actually have cooked in this kitchen. I annoyingly had to go buy two pans, which I hate doing because I love my pans that I have so much. So the thought of like buying more stuff for a kitchen that I feel very happy about really Bug me, but I did. I bought two pans, and we've, we've cooked some legit Shakespearean food in this house already in 48 hours. Um, so there you go. Um, Elaine and Laura Haney uh, asked if you had heard of the tasting history with Max Miller on YouTube. No. They I thought you would like it. Yeah, it's Laura Haney here. Um, first off, you're very cool as someone that's gotten paid to do acting. Um, I'm very impressed that you can make a living at it. Like, kudos to you. You're cool already on that level. But it's this YouTube channel called Tasting History with Max Miller, and he does all these different um, presentations on like historical food that he's recreated. And I think everybody here would like it. But since you did a whole book on it, you know, you should watch it. Well, I'm excited to check it out. I love watching anything, anything about food history. I get so excited about it, and um, and there's there's a lot out there, uh, and so there's a lot that I have not seen, um, but I love it. I'm, I'm particularly, I get particularly fascinated with like food history of more recent food history, actually, uh, and I mean like very recent food history. I love looking at cookbooks from the 80s and 90s because it, the early, uh, all of the 80s and the early 90s because I get, I, I don't know, I just, what part of it is a nostalgic appeal, um, but I, I get sort of obsessed with like why people loved to just have, like you look at cookbooks from that era and it's, it's thousands of pages of like pasta with vegetables. And I, I'm amazed that people could find enough variations or enough reason to put the same variation of one thing in all those different cookbooks. But I love it, I love reading that stuff. And I love um, hearing people talk about it. So I'm going to definitely check it out. So, thank you. so Monica Ng inquired, how did the Chew It taste? Oh, Chew It's incredible. I, 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 I'm not kidding. I probably make them two times a month. Because uh, when I made them, I realized how simple they were, that they are um, perfect for, you can eat them hot, you can eat them cold, um, and they taste they're, they're, 
they're, they're amazing. They're the perfect picnic food, they're portable. Um, Henry would take them to put them in his lunchbox. He'd get some odd looks from his classmates, but you know, he can take it. And, uh, but I, yeah, so I, I love Chewits. Um, plus they're, they're very straightforward flavors. You have pork and you have pastry and then you have um, red currant, you know, dried red currant, which is a kind of fantastically tart fruit. Um, you have uh, earthy spices with mace and nutmeg. And then, you know, it's all approachable. It's not, uh, it's not a crazy out there thing. So I, I, I love chewits. The things that we actually genuinely make on a regular basis are the roasts. Cause the roasts, the only thing that's changed from roasting something 400 years ago to now, other than the oven, would be the kind of spice profile that goes into seasoning the roast before it's roasted. Um, so you're seeing a lot more in Shakespeare's cuisine with roasts, you're seeing a lot more citrus being used, orange, orange peel, um, those kinds of things, uh, as opposed to now where it's generally just going to be like salt, pepper, and some herbs. Um, <clears throat> but with say roasting mutton, uh, now we would roast, you know, if we're roasting mutton or lamb, um, most often we're going to do a very traditional kind of you know, poke it a few times and put some garlic cloves in and then some rose, sprigs of rosemary and then roast it and then that's that and then use the natural juices uh, from that and it's a very simple um, accessible way of roasting lamb and mutton. In Shakespeare's <laughs> England, a classic roast would be uh, a lot of those same things but you would also have orange peel and you would have a sauce thickened with egg yolks and things like that so slightly more elaborate. Um, so we'll eat that We'll eat uh, chewits. Um, my son's absolute favorite thing in the book, which we made a couple of days ago, it's all gone now, um, but I have some pastry in the freezer still, is um, a pistachio cheesecake. Uh, it's his absolute favorite. It's, um, I was pleasantly surprised to learn that in Shakespeare's England, people were eating cheesecake, but it's not like cheesecake now at, at all, as you can imagine, as you guess. Um, Cheesecake now would be, say, you know, a graham cracker crust with butter and sugar, and then, say, cream cheese and some sugar and some egg yolks and eggs uh, kind of beat together and then baked almost very similarly to a custard, possibly in a water bath. That would be a contemporary version of a cheesecake. Shakespeare's version of a cheesecake is a hand-formed crust similar to a chewet crust, uh, and then um, a custard made from egg yolks and and whole eggs, uh, sugar, um, nutmeg, mace, cinnamon, uh, and then a sharper cheese. And a comparable sharper cheese today would be like a Gouda. Um, no, Gouda is not sharp compared to say cheddar or something like that, but it's much sharper than, than it has a much more uh, acidic bite to it than say uh, cream cheese, Philadelphia cream cheese does. So you do, and then you would do that in a farmer's cheese, like a cottage cheese, blend all those things together and bake it similarly to a cheesecake, blend it with pistachios. And then it's, it's sublime. It is just all of these earthy flavors of the pistachio and the cinnamon and the, uh, and the nutmeg and the mace, and then the sharpness of the cheese and then the, um, the occasional bite, the crunch of pistachio. My son goes crazy for it. So. But those are actual things that we legitimately include in our rotation. Along so where, where, did, uh, where did Shakespeare have this pistachio cheesecake? Shakespeare mentions pistachio cheesecake all of nowhere in his plays. But I was looking at this house manual. Uh oh, I'm going to have to change my battery. Sorry, guys. Give me one second. Stay with me. Don't go away. <laughs> um, here we go. All right, new camera, because my battery just died. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. So uh, the, um, the Shakespeare mentions cheesecake, like nowhere. But uh, there is a, um, there are lots of different kind of sweet cakes and how cheese is used in those sweet cakes, like in a, in a Banbury cake. Uh, that, that I thought was interesting, that, that it wasn't entirely out of the field. And then I found this um, cookbook manual that was written in the 1580s, similar to the Jarvis Markham book that I was talking about, like a housekeeping manual. 
And this was written by a woman named Eleanor Fedipus, and there's a recipe for a pistachio cheesecake that was in that book. And I thought, I wonder if it's any good. And, you know, pistachios were just as prized then as they are now. They're, they're a plant that requires an enormous amount of water. So, you know, it's not, they, they, they were expensive then and expensive now. Um, and so I thought, what a cool kind of treat to have. Why not, why not give it a shot? And I made it and I thought it was too good not to put in the book. And since the recipe was, was actually predating Shakespeare, I thought, let's put it in. That's how, that's how I made the cut. So how difficult was it to update measurements and actual ingredients like flour and such in your book? Well, for the most part, very difficult because often quantities aren't listed in these books. Robert May almost never mentions quantities. It, it, these weren't books meant to be uh, for people learning how to cook. They were meant to be reminders for those who already knew how to do everything. So it would be... Um, I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen like the, um, like Escoffier's, you know, the, the guide, the, what we call that, the, the, the guide culinaire, the, 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 the big book of Escoffier's work that's like, mm -hmm. it, it's basically, you know, to make, say, creme brulee, it would be like custard, uh, royal custard, you know, and, and it, so it's not meant for somebody that doesn't know what they're doing, it's meant for a professional. The, the same is true for Robert May's book, so quantities were not listed at all. Um, so much of the time it was me going, okay, what would be a reasonable quantity for say a pastry? So for a hot water crust, for example, I started with, with a contemporary version of a pie crust and then um, altered it to be a hot water crust. So a contemporary pie crust we would call like a three, two, one dough. So 300 grams of flour, 200 grams of butter, 100 grams of ice water, a pinch of salt, that would be a contemporary pie crust. So I started there for a hot water crust, but I changed the water to hot water, and then I halved the amount of fat um, to be uh, to be boiled with the water. Um, that turned out to be too loose of a pastry, and so then I upped the amount of flour, reduced the amount of water, that kind of thing. So there was a lot of experimentation in that. Some things with baking would list quantities but it was for prohibitively large quantities. You would have a peck of flour, for example, which I forget the exact weight, but it's significantly more than a three person household would consume. It's meant for an estate. And so I would do a little bit of culinary act and kind of divide down to, uh, by weight to, um, you know, uh, to smaller quantities and then futz with it until it was something reasonable. So that was, I should mention that in the talk, but I, I just didn't think about it until you asked, but it's, that was probably the most difficult thing in all the research was trying to, to figure out what they meant when they talked about certain quantities. You know, years ago, we had a, um, a presenter who compared early cooking methods to Baroque music or to Bach. And it was, if you saw the music, the way it was written, it's very flat. But then you had the trills and the other things. So it's, it's expected that you know how to cook. And if right. you don't know how to cook, then these recipes are unmanageable. Right. Yeah. And, um, I, I found them to be, I guess I was glad that I, I had already looked at a lot of late 19th century, early 20th century French cookbooks, which are very similar in that sense of like, of just listing a series of steps and no quantities, because then it didn't feel like I was going into completely unknown territory. But it definitely made for a lot of trial and error, especially when it came to things that require a more exact science, like the breads and the pastry. And Cynthia, you wanted to make a recommendation? No, oh, I just it was whoever was reading this. It was just the supersizers on YouTube. <laughs> if you ever get a chance, it was a British TV series where they go through all of history, one like era at a time, but then they also, since you mentioned the 20th century, they go through the 20th century, one decade at a time. Oh, good. Uh, all, just, all with food then? Food, costume, life, everything. 
but it's all food. Yes, they eat everything in sight. And the reason they call it supersizers is they get a checkup before and after. So they find out how bad the food was for them. Um, let's see, I've, I've got the book. I get the book for the cheesecake recipe. Yes, that's <laughs> worth that's the money right there. I'm so proud of the cheesecake recipe because that I, 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 um, one, I keep bringing up my son because he's great, but I also keep bringing up my son because I, I'm just, sometimes I'm amazed with what he does. So the day that I made the pistachio cheesecake, that, that's him in that picture where he's looking at it. So I had taken the, I was taking, uh, that was sort of the final test of the pistachio cheesecake. And I laid it out on the counter at my old house for the video, when you saw the video. And um, I was doing the photographs for it. And then he had gotten home from school <coughs> and he came into the frame and he started looking at it. You know, I said, oh, hold on, I'm gonna get some pictures of you doing that. And then he said, can we have some? And I said, yeah, it'll take me about 20 more, more minutes or so to take pictures, but then you can have some. And he ate a slice of it and he said, can I put this in my lunchbox tomorrow? And I was like, are you sure? Because, you know, elementary school is a tough room when you're eating weird food. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, oh, I want to take, take it to school tomorrow. And uh, can it be the, my treat? And I said, sure. And he, he brought his lunchbox back and it was completely empty and he was so happy with it. A couple of nights ago, I was doing a cooking demonstration, a sort of live demonstration with, through Playbill magazine, our, our theater magazine. Um, and I wasn't cooking in this kitchen, I was cooking in another kitchen in New York. And they wanted the Sasha Cheesecake demonstration, so I did that. And then Henry was still awake, and I said, you want a little bit of sugar just before you go to bed? You want to try it before you go to bed? And he came, and it was cut in half. You know, in half, and then one was in slices, and he didn't go for the slices, he went for the half. <laughs> Put the whole half in his mouth and, and, and ate it, you know, just before bed, which got me all kinds of good points um, from my wife. So, yeah, uh, it, it's a good, I'm really proud of that. It's a super good recipe. And I think our final statement, unless Scott has, well, I know he, Scott will say something more. Um, but um, Elaine and Laura said Jello for everyone. So, do you have any aspic recipes in your cookbook? Um, there. So, uh, I actually have to think about that. Let me go. Let me just kind of quickly do a scan because because um, oh, I do. Yes, I do. Now it doesn't involve um, boiling like a like a a, a a cat knuckle or something like that. Um, which would work, you know, you could take a, you could easily take, a, it works best with like a veal knuckle, um, but you could take a veal knuckle and then, and then uh, boil it in water and then you have sort of like gelatinous substance and then you can flavor that any way you want. But this is actually in the sweets section. Um, so there was a, I'm glad you asked. This is a real, this is also really good. It's shockingly good. So there was a drink um, in Shakespeare's Day, which is talked about in the plays, and um, it was very popular up until I would say the middle of the 18th century, called Hippocras. And it's a series of spices that are strained through a mesh sleeve, um, or that are steeped, that, that, that they're put in a mesh sleeve, and that mesh sleeve is put in a wine uh, of some kind. And then um, the mesh sleeve is removed, and then all of the, the sediment of those spices is removed. And then you're left with like a, a kind of, essentially it's like a mulled wine cold brew, if you can imagine that. So as opposed to a mulled wine where you bring it to a boil, orange peel and clove, all that over the stove, this is, um, it, it's done purely cold. So you put it in that sleeve, remove it, strain all that out, and then you have the Hippocris. Well, that wine, which is called Hippocris. Now it's named Hippocris after Hippocrates sleeve, so they, they thought that the, the mesh is meant to resemble the sleeve of the scholar properties. So that's what you're, that's why it's called that. So what was a popular dessert in Shakespeare's England, because again, this is the period of time in which refined sugar is introduced into the diet. So they're figuring out ways in which they can have refined sugar for everything. And somebody came up with a clever idea of making hypocris jellies. So if you've ever had awful, 
or seen awful wine gummies, like a wine shop. It's basically that, but way cooler, way more uh, interesting flavors than just like popping a gummy bear of wine flavor. So what they would do is they would take uh, the, the highly reduced stock made from things like veal knuckle or uh, pork knuckle, so they'd be flavors. And then that highly reduced stock uh, would then be combined with the jellies and then, um, or with the, with the hypocrites and then allowed to cool, uh, say below in a vault or something like that. And once they cooled, just like jello, it would be this gummy and then they would uh, encrust that gummy with a, with a coarse sugar. So then you have this acidity of the wine, you have all of the earthy spice flavors that you would associate with a mulled wine, the orange, the citrus and orange peel, stuff like that, and then the kind of crunch of the sugar. It's shockingly good. And I made those, those are toward the end of the book along with, the, with other jams and, and, and things like that. But yeah, so believe it or not. But by the way, there just, I thought this was the last question or maybe comment, but is there another mention in Shakespeare of aspic other than the trail left by, I don't know, they killed Cleopatra? The asp, yes, that's what the it asp. is. Oh, that's what it meant. That's okay, I thought it was- comes from. Is it supposed to be the trail left by an asp? An ant? A-N-T? A-S-P. A-S-P is an ant. Okay. Snake. Yeah, the snake. The snakes that... Oh, uh, sorry. Cleopatra and they snake. say it looks like an aspic trail in, in Cleopatra, so I was just wondering if that was the only mention of aspic in Shakespeare. Uh, to my knowledge, it is. I don't, okay. I don't know... I don't know of any other reference because it's so heavily associated with Cleopatra. I don't know. Yeah. Well, because somebody were asking if you made aspic, that's why I was just. Yeah. Uh, any anything else? I'm happy to answer any last things you guys want to know. Do you come no. to Chicago at all to do theater at the, out on the pier? Say that again. Do you ever come to Chicago and do theater out on the pier? Mostly when I work in Chicago, I work uh, at Chicago Shakes. Um, yeah. Here, uh, and then, then I work at the Goodman. Um, and that's it. Those are the places. Uh, but you know, theater is theater is out for the time being. Oh, I know. And so, uh, I, but someday, someday, I, I'm certainly hoping to come back um, because I love it there so much. And, yeah. Um, well, I just got the schedule for next season, so they're planning on coming back. Uh, yeah, they all oh. are. By the way, somebody inquired. I'm sorry, Scott. Somebody inquired where you could maybe could get some of this food, and I would try Rec Pleasant House Bakery, because like they do the Sunday roasts, they do the meat pies. Uh, it may not be exactly Shakespearean, but it's English, and so that brings very you in British, the right direction. Uh, very British stuff. What said yet? I I I I follow up with you guys because if any of you are beer drinkers. I cannot remember the name of this club. They do what's called real ale. So it's like cast fermented ale. It doesn't have any extra carbonation supplied by CO2, like every other beer that we drink. And so the, the ale that they serve, real ale, or if you ever watched Morse on um, Masterpiece or something like that, he's known for drinking real ale. Uh, this would be identical to the method of preparing ale in Shakespeare's day. Yeah. Um, and there is a bar, a pub in um, Wicker Park that serves it, and I can't remember the name, but if any of your beer drinkers, I, I, I might do a follow-up with Scott to get that up to you, because it's, it's totally, it's, it's a fantastic way to kind of taste the past. So. But thank you so much. This was yeah. wonderful, and was uh, I hope you work on another book just so we can have you back again. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for tuning in, and thank you, Scott and Kathy, for uh, asking me to do this. I, I appreciate it so much. I love talking about this stuff, and thank you for asking so many great questions, and um, yeah, thanks so much. Oh, one, one last question. You spoke tonight. Did you, Were you looking at any notes or anything, or? Uh, I have an outline, yeah. Um, so I have an outline that's like not, I, I, I call it a riff outline. So it gives me a subject and I say riff on that. So I glance over at that and I oh. say riff on, you know, how you come up with layout, riff on whatever. And then I'm also looking, <coughs> honestly, I'm also looking at you guys. 
to see if you look bored. And then I go, all right, they, they're, they're, they're doing this, so I'll go through this topic quickly and then I'll <laughs> launch on to the next thing. So that, that there's, a, there's a little bit of fun that we're doing to speak about that. That masterful performance. So thank you so much again. And I got to make the chew it's as soon as I can get back to your book. It, it, looks, it looks wonderful. And even though your son didn't give quite a good review of that at the time, but <laughs> that was a good review because he's a kid. You, you know, if they don't like it, it must be good. But thank you again. And I, I look forward to making a number of things from your book. You take thank care. You. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you. Bye, you guys. Bye.